we sort of paved the way uh, a lot of other people have followed so this has opened up a new type of, of funding which i think is really exciting i genuinely and um really in my core believe that sort of leveraging the community for, for scientific development is, is super exciting and very very useful i think we need as many minds as possible to work on these problems and uh, having you know a thousand people at your back uh, while doing this pro project is is a, is a great strength for sure Hi, everyone, and welcome. Our guest today is Morten Shabai Nutzen, who is an associate professor at the Center for Healthy Aging at the University of Copenhagen. Morten is trained as an MD, but has ded dedicated himself to studying the interplay between DNA damage and aging. He leads the Longevity Molecule Project, which is the first ever longevity project funded through the IPNFT framework and was actually the first project funded by VitaDAL. Uh, Morten's also a former colleague of mine. So uh, yeah, big fan of his work and somebody who inspired me a lot in my journey. And I'm, I'm really excited to be here speaking with you today, Morten. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Hey, thanks for the invitation. It's, it's great to speak with you, Tyler, always. Fantastic. So, Morton, maybe just kicking things off, uh, it would be awesome if you could tell us a little bit about your background, maybe your journey starting with school, what was your motivation to get into the field, and then sort of zooming forward to today, uh, and maybe a little bit about why longevity is, is an interest of yours and, and close to your heart. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think many people in the field have, uh, I think, a similar story in some ways. You know, you, you, I got into the field because you know you see um, you see your family and grandparents grow old and pass away, and this of course makes you wonder about your own mortality in a sense and, and why we age and and what is the underlying mechanism for this, right? So this this is sort of an almost existential uh, question, but this is really actually what got me into actually also into medical school because I was thinking about how, what would be the best way if I ever want to uh, treat a person to, um, to get healthy as we get older, what would be the best way to do that? And so I, I went to medical school and I got a medical degree and I worked briefly as a physician in Denmark and Greenland before then going to the NIH uh, where I was for a number of years and, and meeting you, Tyler, and a lot of other really fantastic researchers. Um, so this is really my journey, I would say. I, I also did a little bit of research when I was in medical school and published a couple of papers, papers about mitochondria then. Um, but then um, going into real aging at the National Institute on Aging was a big opportunity and a very inspiring uh, environment which I think is probably the most credible environment when it comes to aging research. It's, it's very stringent, you know, and not, uh, I think, very opposed to the uh, sort of snake oil type of uh, aging research, which unfortunately is something that, that uh, has plagued the field a little bit, um, but I think it's getting better. Uh, and so then after NIH, I... Uh, came back to the University of Copenhagen and started my own group. And I've been here for, I guess, five, five and a half years now. So, uh, and it's been a journey for sure. Definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, and I'm incredibly fortunate, I think, being able to do what I like and um, been very fortunate with funding and uh, also meeting people like you, Tyler. Yeah, so maybe just to double click on that a little bit. So I mean, I sort of watched you, I think, transition from a, a visiting fellow, more postdoc position into someone who is now running your own group. Can you tell me a little bit about like what that transition was like? So moving from somebody who's probably more behind the bench doing pipetting to, you know, the challenges and, and, and maybe, you know, the work changes that come to actually starting a group, hiring people that you're training, um, presumably spending a lot more of your effort trying to, you know, get your own funding, but now you're also responsible for this other group of people that are training with you. What has that been like? Yeah, I mean, this has been definitely, it's a, it's a tough transition in, in many ways. I think that, you know, the stress 
always increases. You know, you think you're stressful as a medical student, then you think you're stressful as a physician, then you think you're stressful as a postdoc. I would say my stress has sort of gradually increased all the time, but but so I think it's much more stressful being a PI and particularly being um, being responsible for people because people are really dependent on you and your ability to generate funding and ability to come up with uh, scientific ideas and scientific collaborations and and thoughts and um, you know people that, that want to, to to be in the field and want to become PIs themselves. It's it's you know extremely important to do good science and um, so this is all always what I've try to aim for doing like as good science as I possibly can. And always with some sort of angle for interventions. And this, so this has been sort of my um, approach always, but it's also, I mean, my, the gratification of, of doing the work has also increased steadily, even though it's more stressful, it's also much more interesting. So um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> So maybe zooming in on, on the idea of interventions, uh, for those who aren't really familiar with maybe Molecular Vitadel or, or the specific project you've had funded, can you talk a little bit about um, the specific approach for the Longevity Molecule Project um, and maybe just a little bit about you know, why small molecules are interesting, why repurposing is interesting, and, and how this could be particularly promising for the field, uh, maybe in the near term compared with you know, some of the other approaches that, that others are pursuing with respect to interventions? Yeah, so, I mean, we know from animal studies that you're able to manipulate aging or that aging is more plastic than you would think. You know, maybe 100 years ago, people thought that aging was just something that happened, nothing could be done about it. And then some experiments came along showing that you could, with relatively simple dietary interventions, you could actually push uh, lifespan and extend lifespan quite a lot in, in model organisms. Um, in the context of, of humans, we know that, that being healthy as we get older is extremely important, of course, both from a personal perspective, but also from the society. We know that there are drugs that affect lifespan in model organisms. And we have some evidence that there's drugs that uh, affect lifespan and health span also in humans. And so from, um, you know, from a medical perspective, you know, these are really fantastic opportunities to allow people to live healthier for a longer period of time, which is also an extremely good societal investment. And so uh, thinking about um, small molecules and why these are good, uh, good to pursue, I mean, th this is, you know, classic, classic drugs, you know, and being able to target a biological process with a drug is, is something that's uh, relatively straightforward and uh, most often relatively cheap compared to some of the newer uh, approaches, antibody approaches and, and stuff like that. So small molecules are, um, are an opportunity um, and I think a good starting point for, for, for doing this. Um, drug repurposing in terms of, in the context of aging actually came from, um, uh, some of the idea at least came from, from uh, work by Neil Baslai that, 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 and uh, others uh, that showed that, um, that metformin uh, could affect aging. Actually, this was a study also done by Rafa Di Capo and, and I was part of that study at the, uh, uh, at the National Institute on Aging. Um, and Rafa's lab showed that metformin extended lifespan. And Neil Basla is now show, trying to pursue this in humans. And we know from uh, epidemiological data that, um, that actually um, metformin might uh, actually impact aging. Just, show, just looking at that type of data, this is something that needs to be tested. And Neil Basla from Albert Einstein University in New York is actually doing this. So these are, I think, really exciting opportunities to be able to, 
to impact aging. So on that topic, uh, one of the things that really captivated me about the project that you were working on was the idea of, of sort of starting first with human data and, and mm -hmm. working backwards, which I think is a really unique opportunity and something that uh, many, many researchers don't really have the luxury of doing, to, to, to be frank, but can also be incredibly informative. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the specific approach through which you, your laboratory is ultimately identifying these longevity, pro-longevity molecules that you're now sort of testing uh, now in human cells and, and fruit flies and, and uh, other model organisms. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, I, I think maybe also a little bit about my background. I've actually always taken sort of the human approach first uh, in terms either of looking at complex genetic uh, phenotypical interactions, which we did with premature aging diseases at the NIA. Now we, we got very fortunate uh, to be able to, um, to dig into some very, very, uh, deep data here in Denmark. So Denmark has really great registries and we have fantastic uh, data on people's health, but also people's uh, use of medication. And so we can actually look at um, specific drugs that people are taking and then looking at how that affects health span and lifespan. So, so this, data is really massive. I mean, it's, it's uh, there's more than a billion prescriptions in the database and they are each linked to an individual in the Danish society. So we actually can know also uh, health data about that person uh, and uh, also lifespan data because this database goes back uh, very far. Um, so this is a really, I think, strong starting point but then looking at drugs that might affect aging in humans and then testing that in in sort of a more mechanistic way in, in cells and flies so with respect to that data i mean i can imagine that the there's you know a bunch of intrinsic difficulties uh, and deconvolution that comes with working with a, a data set on that scale and of that size what, what are some of the ways that you guys try to control for <laughs> Um, you know, the impact that disease has, for example, um, some of the other confounding factors that might make it difficult to interpret that data. I think what's really interesting, again, from my view, is that you have a data set that is so massive at scale. So I, I think it was some billion number of, of, of data points, ultimately, that it's almost like if you see trends in that data set, it, you have such a, 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 a robust data set that there, it's probably going to be particularly telling. But we'd be curious to understand a little bit how you even manage working with that and how you how you sort of um, derive meaningful insights from it. Yeah, I mean, you, you need a, a strong computer. Um, and, uh, I think this is the, the, the first step, right? But uh, actually, I'm, I mean, it is a lot of data, but it is in it is sort of text data, right? We also do um, you know, image-based analysis of videos of, of animal uh, models. And that data, even though it's on a smaller number of individuals, so to speak, that data is even is actually even larger. So because it's a it's a tabularized data set, the computational um, need is is large, but it's not you know unfeasible. Um, so 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 we can definitely manage to look at patterns in this data set. And maybe just, I know that your laboratory has a sort of ML and, and AI component to it as well. I mean, would you be interested to speak a little bit about the role of what you believe the role of AI will be in the future of both biogerontology, but maybe drug discovery more generally? Yeah, I mean, AI is, is an extremely powerful way to find patterns in data. I mean, it's, and it's in many ways, um, you know, unfeasible to do it in a, another way if you want to find nonlinear relationships, which I think is actually what happens in most um, biological systems. So AI has really emerged as a, as a very, very potent way to, for example, measure rates of aging. And, um, and your rate of aging can, of course, be different from your actual chronological age. Some people age faster, some people age slower. And, and using AI, you can measure that difference. And uh, in my lab, we do that a little bit. 
or we do a third of the lab sort of works on AI. And um, we, um, for example, we've developed a method to look at, uh, at cellular senescence. So this is sort of these cells that accumulate in our bodies when we get old. And um, we can use AI to actually determine which cell is senescent, which cell is not senescent. And we're using that approach for testing drugs also with the longevity molecule. Uh, but, but you can also use uh, you can use AI to other with other things. So, for example, we also have done this on registry data. We have uh, access, in addition to the to the um, to the prescription database, we also have access to something called the pathological database. And so, this is not published, but we've analyzed uh, thirty two million description of pathological findings. So, the text of pathologist. But this right. is more like natural language processing yeah, now. So natural language processing. So this is another way to, to look at machine learning and then develop uh, aging markers in in that way. So telling actually sort of interpreting what uh, decades and almost a century of pathologists think about aging. So this is also, I think, a very interesting approach. Um, and here we can also identify molecules that might impact aging. Is is the Danish society unique in terms of the accessibility or the way that it keeps medical records on its patients and their and their medications? I mean, so I know that if I, I look at a system like the US, for example, there's a large lack of standardization. There's not electronic medical records or something that are sort of progressively being adapted in many cases, not. Uh, did you are you aware of other databases that exist in the world specifically longitudinally? that have access to this level of, of standardized data or is the Danish system quite unique in this context? I think the Danish system is quite unique in this context, particularly in the, in the longitudinal, um, in the longitudinal sense, there is, there are other uh, databases um, that are trying to do some of the same things. I think that the Danish data is, um, sort of data society, a data data registry is 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 unique because it's really well um, it's well curated. So each uh, data point is labeled with a specific identifier, which represents a person, and then you can go into all the data sets, including you know what taxes people have made. Uh, there's even data on exposure levels and you know, where do you live in the country and your education, social status, and um, all of your healthcare records. Um, so it's really massive. And then this is also coupled then with, for example, uh, whatever blood samples you may have taken at some point, or uh, in our case, we looked at pathological samples. Um, and so, so it's, it's really, uh, it's really quite, uh, quite large and I think quite uh, unique in that sense, particularly because it's well interconnected and it's longitudinal. It's go, the, the prescription data set I think goes back to the early seventies. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, extensive. Yeah, it must be incredible to have the opportunity to work on something like this. Like uh, I'm sure most scientists like only dream of having access to that level of like granularity in, in, in data sets. Um, so maybe just moving on, thinking about the project and what you guys have achieved so far um, since you first received funding, maybe we could just start by touching on a little bit about the experimental approach specifically, and then sort of what experiments have been conducted so far, how, how many molecules have you screened, um, and just talking a little bit about where you are at present with, with the overall project. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Maybe I can share, share my screen. So this is sort of the background of this, the study that, that we have survival data on the Danish population uh, over a long period of time. And um, so the thick dark line here is the, is the life, mean lifespan and each of these individual lines here are, um, are then cohorts of individuals that have been given, given or been prescribed the same drug at some point during their life. And so it's clear that there are certain drugs that are associated with a longer lifespan and some drugs that are associated with a shorter lifespan. 
And uh, if we think about going back to sort of the metformin case, we looked also in our database at metformin and found that, so this is uh, looking at everybody that got metformin, the blue line, or everybody else, basically. And you can see that metformin here is actually associated with a shortened lifespan here. But if you go to the graph on the right here, we can see that if you look at people from the age of 70 only, if you get prescribed metformin for the first time when you're 70 or older, then you actually have a survival benefit initially the first 10, 15 years, so suggesting that we're impacting aging. So this is actually some of the basis of the TAME trial that Nia Basla is doing. It looks the same in our data set, although we have much longer data and we can see that eventually crosses over. This is not actually been shown before. Um, and this may be because you get metformin because you have diabetes. So this is an inherent bias in the data set that we have to think about. So going back to the methodology, as you asked about, um, so we're using uh, sort of our two uh, major uh, machine, learned, machine learning approaches, AI approaches, which are uh, a senescence predictor. So we have developed a senescence predictor that's hopefully soon uh, published, third round revisions. Uh, and then we have uh, another uh, approach, which is using fruit flies, uh, using another an AI approach that can measure uh, how fruit flies move. And I'll just uh, uh, skip forward. So we looked at three particular compounds, which had the most significant impact on, on lifespan. These were the original compounds that we wanted to test. So we're testing it in this way. We induce senescence using ionizing radiation. Then we give them drugs. We put drugs on the cells. This is a plate of cells. And then we image them in a, what's called a high content microscope. And then we run this through a senescence predictor. And we can look at senescence or survival and then subsequently validate the drugs uh, in some way. Our um, fly approach is similar or is, is uh, also sort of a semi high throughput approach. We have flies and then we can track the fly movement over time and then look at health, uh, motor function, also lifespan. And this is some data from a large study we did. Um, so this allows us to sort of track how it works. So we go forward with some cell data, Tyler? Yeah, I would love that. Okay, great. Um, so we first tested this XYC compound. And so this here is, uh, is the data on, on these, uh, the, the, the three first drugs that we tested. And this is the amount of cells. And this is the concentration of the drugs. And so we are, we have used, actually, we had, have even used uh, more concentration than this, but this was actually some of the power of the Beta DAO or the, the sort of community um, that is driving this uh, research. This was after a meeting with, with some of the people there that suggested that we should increase our dosage. And so we had, we're using quite high doses here. But I think what's interesting is that uh, looking at cellular senescence prediction, uh, we can see that uh, for X, there is a decrease that's sort of dose dependent. We can see that more here. Um, so this kind of indicates that cells that are senescent become less senescent. Um, we also see this effect with, with uh, drug set, uh, although uh, this is only one dose here, it seems to be some sort of dose dependence. Um, we tested it in flies also. And here, unfortunately, we didn't really see any uh, effect in the flies. So these are large experiments. We actually, um, we also did sort of a late, late life intervention where we tested um, the intervention when we, when we treat uh, flies uh, late in life. And here we've treated about probably a total of around 2000 flies. Um, 
And unfortunately, we haven't seen anything yet for these drugs. But this is a large database. We have three and a half thousand compounds to choose from. So we, we went on and one of our, I think, really promising compounds is a compound called J5, which is uh, one of our new uh, and I think most interesting hits where we see consistent changes. This is the cell, uh, this particular cell line we're testing in, but this actually looks like it's working in all cell lines we've tested so far. So here we see a dose dependent decreases in essence over time. And uh, it decreases the probability of senescence in, in ionizing radiation induced senescent cells. And this we have not really observed in a similar way in the other cell lines. So this is uh, this is a very promising compound, I hope, and and we're testing this now in uh, in flies. Uh, but we actually have also uh, one or two more that that has some promise also. So so I think uh, I think we're in good in good shape so far and, and hopefully we will uh, we will see some effect also in the fly lifespan. Yeah, this is, this is incredible. And I think it's also a good example. I mean, anyone who's spent, I think, any time as a researcher at the bench knows the, the sort of challenges of doing science. And I think one of the interesting opportunities that we have here is because you have such a robust data set with so many compounds, there's like a presumably you could spend the next 10 years mining data from this and looking at different compounds and, and trying to see what works. So it, yeah, it was really exciting to see sort of the project unfold. And, and now it looks like there's uh, two hits that are potentially quite promising to pursue for further validation and, and further studies. So maybe to that end, what what's really next on this journey for the lab? What is after discovering these initial these initial hits? What are some experiments that you're excited about doing in the future to to further validate that they might have efficacy? Yeah, so I mean, first we would like to validate that they work in flies um, and see if there's a lifespan effect. But then uh, one of the things we did when we identified the drugs was that we we compared and we compared each drug with a similar drug that was given to the same type of diagnosis. So that meant that whatever effect we saw on the lifespan was not because of some underlying bias, because of the reason why a person was given that drug. Um, and so that means that the lifespan effects that we're seeing are probably not the primary FDA approved target of that small molecule. It's probably an off target effect, and so identifying that particular target in the cellular context is really exciting. And um, it's exciting, of course, because it will give us something, um, it would tell us something about aging, but it's also exciting because it, it, it makes uh, actually the compound patentable in a, in a different way because it will be a different target, a different use of, of, uh, of the compound. And, Sort of coincidentally, all the compounds we've tested so far are actually off patent compounds. So they are really good, uh, um, you know, good candidates also for modifying them and testing uh, other modifications on the candidate and thereby generate new patentable drugs. So that, I think that's really exciting. Yeah, and particularly exciting for the for the beta down molecule community as well, because uh, you know, as you know, a, a big part of this model really relates to the sort of governance of, of IP and how it evolves over time, and trying to actively leverage a, a community to actually you know have a voice in this process and be able to actively participate. So maybe maybe to that end as well. Um, thanks so much for sharing updates about the project. I think this is going to be yeah really exciting for people to hear, uh, and also yeah, it's nice to see a, a first project already yielding some some promising data. Data and and having a you know a, a promising future ahead of it, but compared to your experience with you know raising funding from from other maybe more traditional sources, whether that was via you know NIH funding or, or typical grant funding versus uh, you know VC funding or, or more private funding, what is how has the Web three approach to funding for your research been, and and you know how is it different from from some of these other more traditional funding experiences? I mean, it, it's been uh, it's been also actually a bit of a journey to get there because because we you know you and me tyler we we had meetings i think bi-weekly for i think two years uh just to pave the way for this new approach of, of how to fund research so this was a 
a challenge, you know, to to really get that going. But I I think, and now after we sort of paved the way, uh, a lot of other people have followed. So this has opened up a, a new type of, of funding, which I think is really exciting. I I genuinely and um, really in my core believe that 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 sort of leveraging the community for, for scientific um, development is, is super exciting and very, very useful because um, I think we need as many minds as possible to work on these problems and uh, having, you know, a thousand people at your back uh, while doing this pro project is, is, a, is a great strength for sure. Yeah, and also thanks to you for continuing to believe in this. I know it was a it was definitely a long journey that you were a part of, you know, while many of the early people were figuring this out before VitaDAO existed in the early days of Molecule. Um, yeah, and it was extremely useful. And I think some of the insights that we had working with you and also interfacing with both the laboratory and the university ultimately laid the groundwork for other projects that came forward and, you know, going from this very long cycle to now, I mean, uh, with Newcastle, for example, it went from first contact to funding in like three or four weeks, which is just a, a massive difference. So yeah, I really appreciate the one, the trust and, and also taking this, this initial risk, but yeah, really hoping that um, yeah, in the future going forward, this, this ends up being a, a meaningful source of funding for the laboratory yeah. and something that enables, uh, um, really a broad community that's fundamentally interested in your work to come together and, and contribute to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. I think I, you know, you have, you have sort of this uh, altruistic idea that you and Paul had, you know, about uh, allowing the masses to participate in, in scientific development. And, you know, I really love that idea. Uh, I mean, it was your idea. I was just sort of on the sideline then, but I really loved it. And uh, and seeing how it's sort of grown and just exploded has has been really just incredible. I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, it started like I think the most powerful thing about it is particularly in Web three or decentralized structures was just all of the minds that managed to add new ideas. You know, bring in a ton of smart people into the room with a low barrier to entry to contribute. Like our idea was just an initial, initial catalyst. And then ultimately what what ended up being translated into things like VitaDAO and what Molecule is today is like a function of a bunch of people like yourself and others really, um, yeah, sort of proving that, that collaboration, even on the ideation level, just not even the sciences on a sort of macro systems level is ultimately more valuable than, you know, any one person thinking about something. So yeah, this is a value that I think, um, is sort of spreading through the space uh, and, and that I'm really excited about. There's a bunch of young folks and academics that are sort of getting into this Web3 biopharma intersection. And I'm yeah hoping to see the space continue to grow for, for years to come. It, maybe on that note, I mean, have you looked any any uh, more deeply into Web3, anything that you're interested in uh, about happening in the blockchain space? Are you starting to see it touch other areas as well? I know you you have a pretty full-on schedule without deep diving into it. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is... I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, this is an area where I'm not an expert for sure. I mean, I, I think what um, is potentially very powerful about sort of decentralized science is the data sharing, in my opinion, um, because um, you have the ability to track data and you have the ability to know where the data come, came from. Uh, so that means that, that uh, you don't have to worry too much about um, who's first, who was the first to actually discover this thing, which in science, unfortunately, or in, in a way is, is important because people need to put on their grand application that they discovered this thing, right? Uh, but having a decentralized science, I think is probably good for humanity. You know, it, it will, uh, I hope propel um, knowledge sharing much more quickly. And I think, I think this is where I see it being most exciting, but I, but I mean, I, I'm definitely not an expert here. You know, I, I'm I'm running a, a lab and been very very fortunate to be involved in in the development of of um, of Vita Dao and uh, seeing molecule grow. Um, so I think this is exciting. 
I mean, whether you like it or not, you are a pioneer in the space. So <laughs> even even if you're not an expert, you've done some pioneering <laughs> work and as the as the first recipient of this sort of funding. So yeah, really appreciate your contributions and and your trust and sort of um, paving the way for hopefully a generation of researchers to come after you. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak to us, Martin. Really appreciate it. And yeah, awesome to hear all the happenings in the lab. Thanks, Tyler. It's great to see you. And uh, out there, please uh, check out Beta Dao and check out Molecule. These are really fantastic uh, approaches for the betterment of humankind. Awesome. Thanks so much. See you.